Well, thank you for coming over to the Lightning Talk about diversity and development. First question, how many people come from workplaces that they would consider diverse? Show of hands. All of you, yay. So this is going to be super easy talk. We all, we can all go home and have snacks. Yeah. All right. So the purpose of this talk, I'm actually going to be looking a bit about mentoring and how we can mentor humans that maybe aren't like us. Um, in terms of their background or things that they're bringing to the table that we can be more mindful of so that we can help our teams grow and scale out and be more diverse over time. And I start this by just quick question, why do we hire people, right? There's usually the blanket statement of why we hire someone. I want someone who does this particular type of cloud. I want someone who can write in this language. I want someone who can work with Cisco networking. <laughs> And when we do that, we write up a job rec, but once someone has sent us their resume and we start to go through the phone process and then the in-person process, we start to evaluate other things. For example, if we know that our team could really use a team lead, we might not be posting for a team lead, but we might look for leadership acumen and see if that person presents as someone that we would call a leader. And the once we start bridging out into that, we start to introduce what could be our cognitive biases, how we've been socialized to interact with each other, Someone who might have leadership, who presents leadership differently than we're expecting, we might not register that as an example. And our perceptions are built over time, and they're things that we learn to do, but there are also things that we can learn to undo. And relevantly to this, there's a story I like to tell about serendipity, and it's the reason I named the talk the way that I did. In 2015, there was a developer on the Medium blog platform, and they got a book ticket, and it said, I cannot type a diacritic S. And the team was like, we don't, we don't parse language. But they replicated the bug and pushed it into their, into their queue because they couldn't do it either. And there was one developer on the team who happened to be from Poland. And he said, I know why this is. Because we might not be doing language processing, but I know as a Polish developer how the diacritic S is typed. And what we do do is prevent people from saving index.html to their desktop. We prevent that command or control S stroke from happening what, the way it normally would. And he was able to solve that problem very quickly. And importantly, Medium did not hire him for being Polish. They just solved this problem because they happened to have a Polish person. And I have this blog post actually linked in my resources at the very end, because it's actually very interesting. He goes into the history of typewriters in Poland and, and such. But you can see already that in this team, they expanded their solution space just by diversifying, right? And when you're diversifying in this way, the state of diversity is considered to be fragile. And by fragile, I mean non-self-sustaining. You have to bring people in from different backgrounds. And sometimes those different backgrounds might be language diverse or things like that, things that are maybe a little bit easier in Europe than the States, for sure. But then you have people from different gender backgrounds or that are coming from different cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and et cetera. And what ends up happening is a group that already exists in a certain fashion is viewed as successful and will continue to perpetuate itself unless they reach out and bring these other people in. The other facet is that diversity is very complicated in this way because already just by the series of adjectives I had to use to get here, you can see it's not just as simple as race or language or country of origin or gender presentation or sexual orientation or, or, or. There's a lot of things that diversity can mean to different people and we want to encompass as many of them as possible. But to scope it down, it's not all about saying, okay, well, we don't have a person who's a woman. We don't have a person who's gay. We don't have a person who is this particular religious background and so on. That's not what we're mainly doing. We're mainly saying, how can we be more plastic? How can we be more flexible in our acceptance of these other people? And the way we do that is understand how our life experiences impacts our mindset, going back to bias. And mindset is so very important, I'm going to say it twice. Because when you have someone who's presenting to you, and let's say you have an employee who maybe doesn't voice his, her, their opinions as often as you, the manager, would prefer, if you approach that as a, I need to fix you, versus an I need to coach you, you're going to handle the problem very differently. And this is how we can develop this flexibility. And there are a series of subtle mind shifts that we can do in that vein and I'm going to go through them kind of rapidly in this style of talk where we can shift the mind so that we can present and help our people, new newbies, 
mentees, people in our community integrate so that we can all work together and solve more problems because problems are cool. One of the first ones that I encounter is about coaching versus rescuing. And this is a subtle thing that usually comes up. Usually the way that this presents is you'll have someone who asks a question. And if they present one way, they might get an answer like, oh, let me show you how to do it so you can replicate it and do it again. But someone else might ask the same question and get the answer, oh, let me sh show you what to look up and show me what you find when you build it. As a one-off, this means nothing, right? It's just an answer to a question. But if it becomes systemic over a person's like internship or how they're developing their mindset of, with code and with networking and all the things that they need to function in industry, you're gonna get two different styles of engineer. You're going to have one who's very reactive and one who's very proactive just based on the style that they were taught. And we wanna definitely lean towards coaching. We don't need to do for them, we need them to do for them. Similarly to having them do for them, there's a concept of hand up versus out. And hand out for anyone unfamiliar, the slang where you're, you're giving it to someone. And so someone might say, oh, I got them that job. That's how this kind of presents. But you didn't want to get them that job. You wanted to empower them so they could get them that job, whatever that job is. That might involve just introducing them to the, your network. It might involve saying, hey, these are the industry relevant topics that you should be reading about. Focus your study so that they can present a case for themselves by themselves and you're coaching them through how to talk, talk about themselves and talk about their skills and what's relevant. And that's the idea of helping and empowering and assisting. Supporting different life st learning styles also comes up quite frequently. How many people here have been told to read the manual at some juncture when they ask a question? I see nodding. I feel like we're in the post lunch slump. So not too many hands, but I got nods. And the idea is, oh, this has been documented, so read it. But there are things where documentation can be a barrier to entry. It might be a barrier to entry because highly relevantly, it might be written in English. English might not be your native language. It might be a barrier to entry because you're a developer and it's written for an infrastructure person, so it's not scoped to your question appropriately. You might be a newbie and it's targeting a senior so it doesn't have enough detail for you. There's usually only one set of docs, right? You don't usually have five sets of documentation per audience, right? And it goes beyond just not reading the docs, right? There are different pe ways that people learn. Sometimes they need to ask a question. They need the social engagement. Some people do better with reading. Some people do better with experimenting and tinkering with something until it functions. And as we become no more diverse, we're going to see more of different types of people appearing in our teams, and we'll start to accommodate them, and they will start to accommodate us as well. as we get more people on our teams, there's this idea that we might be teaching them one skill, but they're still bringing other skills to the table. And this is referred to as reciprocal mentorship. And as an example, one of the groups that I run in back in Buffalo, Niagara, where I'm from, th we do a lot of mentorship and classes and things like that for development, focusing on underrepresented groups. And a young woman approached us because she wanted to be on the leadership team. And she was a rising senior in college, so just about to start her career. And she wanted our help with mentoring, but she also wanted to volunteer on the leadership org. This girl was very organized. She just presented, she could clearly task manage like not, no one's business. So we had her handle like our projects and handle our timings so that we could coordinate more efficiently amongst us as a leadership org. But then we mentored her so that she could go into the community and know who to know, know what topics to know. And again, the things that would be relevant to her starting her job as a mobile developer as it happened, right? She didn't not bring nothing when she came to us just because she didn't know about a certain style of development. She brought quite a lot, but we needed to be aware of that. Like mentally, we needed to acknowledge that this is something she's bringing to us. And this is the same in employment teams too, when you have a ju more junior person or a more new person that they're bringing things to you. The other thing is when you have someone who's in a mentorship capacity, whether it be a more senior member of a team or whether it be more one-on-one -on -one or in the broader community. Providing challenges is one of the key things that you can do for a new person to help them learn a career. But a lot of times this will start to manifest as, oh, if you want to learn, we'll pick on Python. You want to learn Python, so find a problem you want to solve and solve it with Python. But then the person who's solving the problem is bounded by ignorance on two ways. They're bounded by the type of problem they think to solve, which may not be relevant to how they'll be using Python at all. And they're limited for what they think to solve it as. And by that I mean they're gonna 
maybe go through it procedurally or whatever their background is, they might not be learning the concepts in their solution that would be relevant to them in the industry. But as a mentor, you can say, you know what, this type of project will force you by its nature to touch on the relevant aspects of, we'll say, Python development and data science. And I know this as an incumbent, so now I'm telling you, and I'm providing you with this challenge to solve. Within our teams, we can also develop proactive resilience versus passive acceptance. And the idea is if the team already looks and has a certain demographic and functions a particular way, if we just say, oh, well, that's that then, that is kind of the passive acceptance, where if you want to have maybe more women or more men or more people from a different background or speaking a different language or a particular group, you're just going to see if they come to you. It's this very passive thing where you're like, you want them, but not enough to reach out to them. But proactive is when you start to reach out to different groups and say, you know what, we are really underrepresented in this area and we want to bring these people to the table and have conversations with them and hear their thoughts and opinions on how we're developing our products. And then you're reaching out to the communities either locally or more globally, again, depending on the scale of what you're trying to do. And that's how you can develop that type of resilience and really build good teams. Something that appears quite a lot with advice that are given to underrepresented groups in particular is this fake it till you make it advice with regards to confidence. So confidence is typically built on two pillars, knowledge and experience. Usually if those are pretty sound, you have someone who is relatively confident, right? You can sometimes have someone who's not confident, but if they're lacking knowledge and experience, telling them to fake the confidence and hoping it'll manifest won't actually help them. It's not building their knowledge or experience. There's nothing for that confidence to sit on, so it'll ultimately fail. What you would want to do instead is say, okay, well, why aren't you confident? Are you maybe lacking something that you consider a critical skill or a passion skill that you really, really need my help on? And once you start fixing that gap, the confidence will follow. Another really important area, explicit onboarding with teams is super important because without explicit onboarding, does anyone want to hazard a guess what you get? Social onboarding. So social onboarding is what happens when it's, I as the newbie will ask questions for problems as I encounter them. And that means that I'm limited in scope of knowledge to problems that happen to occur during my onboarding period. That's not great, right? There might be a documented source of knowledge. Maybe there's an internal wiki or Confluence or whatever that people are maintaining. There are things that I maybe need to know. Maybe I'm working on infrastructure and something over here in this service needs attention all the time. If no one's documenting that and telling me to learn that that's a problem, I'm just going to not know it's a problem until I'm on my first on-call rotation. <laughs> and I get buzzed about it with no warning. And that's not a place you wanna be. A big thing that comes up in coaching is titles as well, right? Job titles matter. We like to think they don't, but they do. How many of you are familiar with the title DevOps engineer? I don't know if that title translates. I see a nod, okay. So DevOps is a philosophy and sometimes in the community people argue DevOps is not a title. Sometimes DevOps is not a title, fight me. It can get a little amusing. But the idea is you, get, you see more and more of these posts for DevOps engineer. And in practice, those posts have been replacing site reliability engineer, infrastructure engineer, and cloud engineer. But the benefit to knowing that is if you know to look for DevOps engineer or you know to negotiate for that title, at least in the States, you can get a 15 to 20% pay bump. Who doesn't want to get paid more for the same labor? And if you know that about your industry, if you know what titles in, for instance, networking relevantly are more fluctuant or like are more sustainable and pay more and et cetera, you can coach your mentees and say, hey, you should be advocating for this title. It's the same job, but you'll get paid better and you'll rise to seniority faster. Hiring Nucleus is what people need to know and who people need to know within a community. This can flux quite a lot, right? So if you're hiring for relevantly in Barcelona, there's going to be a group, a series of tech companies, the who's who of Barcelona. But if you're hiring in Europe, there's going to be a different group of people to know. If you're hiring globally, there's gonna be yet another different group of people to know. If you're mentoring someone, you know they're gonna be doing remote work or you know they're gonna be only working in a specific city, you can coach them through how to figure this out or if you already know it, introduce them to whatever your networking circle is 
to ensure that they're able to navigate the situation because this is the one of the hardest part of the social networking part of jobs, right? Is figuring out who actually can help you be employed and stay sustainably employed. Lastly, but not leastly, something that's taken off in the States is this concept of lean coffee. Has anyone here done a lean coffee or know what I'm talking about? Coffee ops is also another term for it. No. Someone's smiling, so maybe. All right, so lean coffee, coffee ops, coffee meetups, code and coffee are all iterations of this concept that's been taking off in the States where you're basically making a generic code or a generic IT meetup. And the idea is it forces a spectrum of people from junior to senior to socialize and solve problems in a way they would not organically otherwise be able to do right? Because you're not normally going to get people from different companies solving the same problem. And the idea is that someone brings something they want to talk about or a project they want to work on, and then whomever is showing to this meetup contributes ideas, and they basically brainstorm together for that 30 minutes to an hour, however long it is. I think this is a neat idea. We've been doing it in Buffalo as well for the past three years, and it's really great. It also helps with the networking as an aside, right? Because junior people bring questions and senior people can see how they think. And that always works out swimmingly. Right? And as I said, last but not least, so that means I know I hit you with a lot. Summary slide. <laughs> there was a lot of data in there, and this is a very please take what applies to you presentation because there are lots of things that different teams can do, and everybody's in a different place. That said, being open to different learning cycles, styles, empowering people to learn rather than, you know, dragging them behind you and informing them of what's relevant and scoping it to them are pretty much the best ways to go forward when we're looking at mentorship opportunities for, for newbies, both in our companies and in our broader communities. And with that said, we are now in the Q&A section of this conversation. Who has a question, if at all? Because I see furrowed brows. As a bonus, I brought my custom App Dynamics notebook, and if someone asks me a good question, they can get a notebook. No? All right. In that case, yeah? I'm going to need you to walk up a little bit because I can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> I think the hand, hand up rather than hand out is really interesting. Yeah. And, and the, whole, the whole mentoring thing it ties into leadership and that's just what yes. you understand your team. Because you're saying right. people need, need different directions and different skill levels. So right. I'm just really interested in, in how I can change my way of dealing with people now to rather than say, here, this is how I would do it. Here's how I would do it, to, right. To be a bit cleverer about it. Because, of course, that would also affect the tempo. And yes. Sometimes you have to accept a little risk. Right, and to summarize it for those listening and streaming, the idea is that mentorship is heavily customized. So, like hand up, hand, the hand up, not out slide specifically was referenced, and the idea is maybe I'm not flatlined across all my skills, right? So since we're picking on technologies, Python and AWS, I might know a ton of one and none of the other. And as you're pacing my onboarding, then you would need to take that into account as my hypothetical mentor or manager to make sure that they start to equalize to the degree that they need to for my role. Absolutely. Anybody else? I'm going to walk over to you. Say it one more time. How do you know when to mentor and when to coach? I would say it would come up a couple of ways. One is if someone directly approaches you or if you're in a situation where that's being fostered, right? You will be asked to be someone's mentor. That would be the direct. Um, if you're in a working environment, usually you're going to be in a situation if there's a power difference, you're, someone's directly reporting to you, then that would also be a mentorship situation. If you're talking about coaching, in my opinion, that would be more broad community because you're not able to as directly influence them, right? If you're doing something internal, then you know the who's who in your company and you can empower them up that way. It is a very subtle depth, like slide though, right? And it's also gonna be very case by case. 
I would say the best way to proceed would be to ask if what what someone would need from you, because sometimes you might, especially since people really want to do well by each other, we have a tendency. We're engineers. We engineer solutions. We want to solve all your problems, right? We will overcommit to this other human being and be like, "Oh, please come join my industry that I love so." And maybe they don't need all of that; they just need some of it. Yeah. Anybody else? Sorry. How do you monetize the coding copies? Because okay. It's, it's time spent by the senior, usually on your side, mm -hmm. and asking for the juniors to come in to, 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 to integrate. Okay. And also, you have to put some efforts on the other companies or your, your networks to, to bring them up and, and put them in the good place. And also, to attract with the subjects so uh, you are somehow the moderator. Yes. Okay. So the question being asked is, how do you monetize the code and coffees? Because people are essentially donating their time. The way that it's taken off in the States is that code and coffees in particular are generally considered volunteer effort. However, some of the groups that I've been a part of in the past, they might have a code and coffee meetup. And that's mainly to let people know they exist. So that's like PR-ish. And then the other thing that they do is they might provide workshops and classes and those are paid. So people who are in an instructor capacity, will get a thank you donation monetarily for their time. But at the Code and Coffee, since it's viewed as a, it's more social networking, professional networking event with questions that are relevant, that's going to be that's going to be unpaid in terms of like the different seniors that are involved. They're going to be donating their time. So the question, the follow-up question was about internal resources and not all companies have the same resource pool. The code and coffees in general are not company specific. So you wouldn't have Cisco's code and coffee, but you might have International Women's Group Coffee, which is a separate, either a, an actual nonprofit org or some entity, like a meetup group or similar to this. So it's not, it's not filtering money in the same way. Now with corporate, you would want to get stakeholders in management if you wanted to do internal code and coffees, which a company the size of Cisco could certainly do. But in order to do that, you would need the stakeholders because the stakeholders would be the ones upselling it to their engineers saying, I want you to make this part of your schedule. And what can we do about your other responsibilities to make sure that you can? Because otherwise, they're just tacking on more responsibility and that's going to lead to burnout. Yeah. So they, yeah. This is about the explicit onboarding. It's yes. That, that in my experience, we generally quite bad at. You sort of you arrive and you get tagged a mentor and you're left to run with your own thing. Can you give us some ideas of how we can better uh, conduct explicit onboarding? Sure. Rather than just the document, read that. Yeah, so the question being asked is how to handle explicit onboarding because we basically fire hose people. Is that a good summary? Yeah. Okay. When you're doing explicit onboarding um, and you're firing hosing people, you're right because they're going to get hit with a ton of information. They're not going to have any context for it. But if you stage it and draw it out more and you're explicit with how you're drawing it out, you can actually make it a little more sustainable. So a lot of new employees, you're, you have a lot of anxiety. We've all been a new employee at some point somewhere. You have a lot of anxiety. You want to prove yourself. You want to show that you're a good hire and they made a good investment in you. And you're going to like blast your way through these materials, right? They're going to like read this confluence, all of it, whatever, right? That is the request. If you're not explicit with how long the onboarding period is, though, they're going to try and blast through it in like a week. But maybe in your head, you're like, well, I would like you to read it in a week, but I don't actually expect you to understand it for 90 days. So then they'll go back and keep rereading it and keep learning and keep iterating. You need to foster this, what we call psychological safety, which is both the freedom to fail, but the freedom to iterate as well. And they're going to learn and branch out and know that they are safe to ask questions, even if they think to themselves, this question is really dumb. I'm the only one that needs to ask this because I'm new. But they need to ask it because they're new, and they need to know that they can. So fostering the psychological safety and staging out the onboarding, I think, can help. Having onboarding that's diverse in source will help. So not just reading a confluence, but if you have the resources for it, if you can have someone record even just five minutes of them just talking at a camera about what's relevant to their job, 
that is still going to be another source of information for this new hire. Yeah. And of course, clear expectations. If you know, I, I picked 90 days because it's a common number, but if you know for your experience it's going to be less or more than that, just tell them right out of the gate. You're going to get a lot of information. I don't expect you to digest it for X days. Yeah. Any other questions? Going once, twice, sold. All right. Thank you very much. Please fill out the survey when you guys leave. And Cisco would also like me to let you know that they are live streaming and recording all of our talks. I do have references available outside of this, what's on the slide, including that blog post that I mentioned, which is on the second link. So if you want to take a picture of a slide, this is a slide I recommend taking a picture of. <laughs> if you have any follow-up questions beyond this, I am pingable on Teams, both by name or just by joining the discuss discussion associated with this lightning session. Again, complete your survey, please. But also, continuing ed with the walk-in labs and workshops that are going on, especially if you know you want to follow a cert path like IT management. All right. Good talk. Thank you for coming. Have a great rest of Cisco Live.